Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson at the Chihuly exhibit at the New York Botanical Garden. This is Dale Chihuly's first major garden exhibition in New York in more than 10 years and showcases over 20 installations, including drawings and his early works that are set within the New York Botanical Garden's landmark landscape and buildings. This sensory-filled exhibition is a must-see from now through October 29th. While the New York Botanical Garden offers living canvases by Chihuly, there's another vibrant art community in New York City. And the artists who work there have a very special message. As adults, there is a need for more services, and especially arts. There's very little funding for arts for people with autism on the spectrum, but yet there's so many talented artists looking for these types of specialized programs and services. Pure Vision Arts was founded in 2002 by the Shield Institute, and it's New York's premier studio and gallery for artists with autism and other developmental challenges. Susan Brown is one of the artists that started with us on the very first day we opened. She has been one of our most popular artists in terms of collectors. She's known for her unique gridded portraits, especially of her mother, and she is widely collected all over the world, and people really appreciate her design, her, her unique way of seeing and reflecting her, her views of the world. Oh, I love it here. It's a big value. Not painted when I was a kid, maybe some. But I started painting a lot when I early 30s. I still use crayons and markers. Sometimes once in a blue and pastel, sometimes watercolor. Chase Ferguson is our artist that solely devotes his time and interest to the transit themed work. So he makes the parking meters, the traffic lights, the cars, the buses and trains. And he actually started making these vehicles as toys as a child. And then over the years, he's perfected this unique technique. And now his work is included in many private collections and you know exhibitions and is uh, beloved all over the world. I started making paper models when I was in 1999, when I was 11 years old classic car models, vehicles, from 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s. 1949 Chrysler New Yorker convertible. Many of our artists do work with non-traditional materials like Chase and Christopher often work with just cardboard. Many outsider artists or self-taught artists use readily available materials. I usually work on like swords, shields, ancient armaments, you know, things from the ancient world. I just made it up myself. I, I started seeing like, you know, I wanted to try something that I don't see normal people do. Elisa Huberman, she does love animals, she loves children's literature, and she's recently written, illustrated, and published a book four children called The Odd Duckling, and it's very autobiographical about a duck on the autism spectrum that finds meaning and acceptance through art. I always take inspiration from my interest in myths and legends, fairy tales and fantasy, to movies and books. I do um, artwork like sketches, paintings, and watercolor. I get to um, share my work with my friends and even have the uh, world see my work. Many of our artists have sold a, a good bit of their work. They make income from it. And over the years, we've literally sold thousands of pieces to very uh, enthusiastic collectors. There is a movement of inclusion and accessibility for people with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, Pure Vision Arts is on the forefront of that by making arts accessible and we provide people with their studio space, exhibition opportunities, all the materials they need to create their art and express themselves. It's more of a community of like-minded people that share the same hopes and dreams and goals of being an artist. So that's now become a, a group of friends and peers that support each other, show and share ideas, and mentor each other as well. In our next story, Tina Beth Pina shows us how science and art come together when selfies become 3D. Some of us like taking selfies and looking at pictures of ourselves. 
But what if you were able to take that selfie to the next level? What if that selfie is in 3D? These aren't just regular figurines. These are 3D figures of actual people or their pets. These are dubs. A dube is a hyper-realistic looking 3D printed figurine of yourself. The technology started about five, six years ago in Germany uh, with the body scanning technology, originally intended for medical applications, like for prosthetics. But um, within a few years, they started this concept uh, by opening these stores so people could come in and get scanned themselves for the figurines, and it really took off. The duplicator, which is a play on the word duplicate, is a scanning process that uses photogrammetry which is the art and science of obtaining reliable information or measurements of physical objects through photos. We have 54 digital cameras in our scanner, so when you get scanned it takes a split second, but we have 54 different angles of you, and that's what's needed to really create our models for these figurines. Those 54 images are uploaded to a data team, which creates a 3D model file that's sent to the Dube Production Center in Brooklyn. They create what's called a print build, and that will have anywhere from 15 to 20 different figurines in one print build that's going to be made by the printer. So essentially, that is some computer software that's setting that up, and then the printer itself runs for about 12 hours. The ProJet 660, it uses an additive manufacturing process that prints each of the figures layer by layer, and the powder, which is made of a polymer resin, binds with the ink to create the figure, and then we go in and excavate it out of the powder, and the vacuum takes the powder, puts it back into the machine, we use it for the next print. And then the next part goes into the cleaning chamber where we blow off all the extra power, powder. After all the excess is blown and brushed off, the dubes are dipped into a curing solution, toweled off and dried overnight. By the next day, you have a sturdy and yet fragile piece of art. We're always striving to improve every part of this process, trying to make it more efficient, trying to make the figures feel even more quality. It's an heirloom piece, so people spend a lot of money on it, and it's something that they hope to have forever. Dubes can cost anywhere from $95 to $695, depending on the size. And there are only four dube locations in the United States. Keep in mind that digital plastic surgery is not allowed. We do not necessarily do any of those digital touch-ups, so essentially how you are when you step inside that scanner is how your figurine is going to look. But there are future digital benefits. But you can imagine coming here, getting your body scan done, and then creating a 3D avatar of yourself that could be used in a video game, in a virtual reality setting, in a music video, um, with apparel makers. You could try to custom fit clothing to your exact body dimension. So, all sorts of exciting future applications on the digital side as well. Do keeps your information on file just in case you want multiple figurines of yourself. And if you do purchase more, you'll get a discount. And of course, as you've seen throughout the story, me and my cameraman got dubed. So mini-me's, take it away. For Arts in the City, I'm Tina Beth Pina. Poetry knows no age, and proving that point is a collection of poems by Rita Satz. Carol Ann Riddell recently sat down with her to talk about her book, There You Are. It cups my elbow lightly, balancing me across the street. The hand that is light, firm, trying to say, you don't need me, but I'm here. At 92 years old, Rita Satz discovered a voice she didn't know she had, the voice of a poet. Her just-published collection of poems, There You Are, is a moving tribute to love, loss, and the quiet beauty of ordinary days. After raising her family, Rita spent more than 20 years as a television news writer and producer, a familiar face to many of us in the business. But poetry wasn't something she considered. In fact, she only began writing recently as part of a workshop. Were you just hiding this poetry from us all these years? I was hiding it from myself. Okay. Uh, because it just never occurred to me. The only writing I really did was news writing, and that's as far from poetry as you can get. I can attest to that, Rita. I can. I mean, I've known you in the news business for a long time now. I did not know that you had poetry inside of you. Neither did I. 
Rita's deep love affair with her husband comes through time and again in her poems. I was very much in love with my husband, whom I met when it was during World War II, so we married very young, and, and he died eight years ago. So um, a lot of them reflect that. For example, the poem Alone in Bed, which reads in part, It's the worst time of day, the moment I wake up. Open my eyes in the big, soft bed, soft with down comforters and piled up pillows, too big. Every single morning when I wake up, I realize my husband isn't there. And uh, it's eight years, and it's every single morning. I hate waking up. Uh, I almost instinctively reach for him. The poem Hands captures the circular pattern of our lives, from a parent caring for a child to that child caring for the parent. Did my hand feel light, firm when I took his small one in mine to walk him across the street, through traffic, through life? When was the moment he knew I knew he didn't need my hand, didn't want it, needed to swing his arms freely, uncurl his fingers? Now we take each other's hands because we want to. And it's such a universal theme in the sort of shifting roles that we have yeah, in our lives. It really is. You take care of your children and then uh, uh, they want to take care of you. Yes. And um, we resist it. <laughs> what would you say to those people who feel at various points in their lives, it's too late for me to start this over. I can't possibly do that now. You did this at the age of 92. You discovered you are, in fact, a poet. I think the only thing I can say to people is try. I think the one thing that's worked for me very well is that um, I never started anything that I knew how to do. And um, I wasn't afraid to try. Perhaps a lesson for all of us. Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. <laughs>
of the night. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. You always Coming to a new country is risky. And one student from the CUNY School of Journalism found just how that gamble transformed the life of one Russian artist. People all the time told me in the, my past that you are nothing or you are like, you still drawing like kid or you, you choose some kind of strange colors. It still hurts and make me sometimes crying. And all the time I think like, why? Like, why in, in the place where I was born, people don't appreciate us? Like, Russians sometimes don't appreciate the Russians people. I have kind of feeling that my life's somewhere. I really have feeling that I was born in not the spot what I want. Two years ago, I was open my email and I saw one gallery in New York was asked me for do you want to like share your art with us and do you want to go on your exhibition we can create it and it was like that's enough for me it doesn't matter how hard it, it's gonna be I just take my art and go <laughs> only strong people can immigrate if you're just alone in the city you go insane I still like think that oh my gosh how I'm living right here one year without my family this is the most hardest thing like, for me. I found Anna on the Instagram, and I decided to write her and ask her, like, do you live in New York? Because I really like your, your style. Like, that colors, what she did. And I just wrote to her, do you, do you teach somebody? Do you give classes? That classes what I got for drawings, gave me a lot of good vision how to make my art better. My lawyer, when she looked at my art, she was like, Anna, of course you have to go on extraordinary visa, and of course you have to have great exhibitions right here, but you're gonna work. And you have to have proof to the people, to their police governments and everybody that you deserve it. First of all, pr prove yourself. I already put my art walls. One year and, and five exhibitions already. Uh, I heard that something is ringing. I was taking my phone and I was just looking at my lawyer and, and she was like, Anna, congratulations, you have your first documents. I was like, what? I wasn't expecting that it's gonna happen, like the dream could come true. Right now every doors are open for me just because I'm legal. Of course I'm gonna do something bigger, of course I'm gonna find bigger galleries. Just, you know, do the same. Painting for people. Miles Davis, Wynton Marsalis, even Harry Connick Jr. Those are some of the jazz greats. But our own Kyung Yoon found one saxophonist who's taking the jazz world by storm. <laughs> She's being hailed as a new face of jazz. With her aqua streaked hair and Asian ethnicity, Grace Kelly is not your typical jazz standard. There's so many things about my name and the way I look. Being a, a woman and Asian American and playing this instrument saxophone and jazz is, is very unusual. But the 25-year-old music sensation says when it comes to jazz, all that really matters is whether or not you've got the chops. I've been extremely lucky that I've had mentors in this music, like the alto great Phil Woods, who played with Dizzy Gillespie and was in Quincy Jones' band, Lee Konitz, who was in Miles Davis's No Net, you know, Wynton Marsalis, Harry Connick Jr., who have taken me under their wing and had me play with them, uh, Frank Morgan's another, and never judged me on how I looked or said, oh, no, she, she can't join us because she doesn't look like us. So I'm grateful for those mentors and, and the community that, um, the community is kind of like, hey, if you can play, you can play, you know, if you're making great music. 
The past year has been an especially exciting one for Kelly, having been a regular on Stephen Colbert's Late Show Band and releasing her 10th CD, which got voted number two jazz album of 2016 by Downbeat Magazine. She's come a long way since first picking up the saxophone when she was 10 years old. I fell in love with it instantly. I had my first performance at Borders Books six weeks after I started playing and I was playing these jazz standards. And I was so small at the time that I had to put my case out, sit on my case and put a pillow in front and play sitting down. She went on to record her first album at the age of 12, performed as a teenager at President Obama's inauguration and has toured more than 30 countries as a band leader. Born as Grace Chung in Wellesley, Massachusetts, Kelly adopted her stepfather's Irish surname when she was eight years old. My parents played a lot of the tenor saxophone of Stan Getz when I was growing up. And these great Brazilian songs, you know, Joe Beam, Girl from Ipanema, and Stan Getz would play on these songs. And I just grew up with these recordings and loving the sound that he would make from the saxophone. So I think in my head, I always knew I love the saxophone. She also grew up singing and making up her own songs, here belting out her first composition when she was seven years old. On my way home, looking for someone. My mom, she said, as soon as you could talk, you were singing. And I was a huge Broadway lover. I mean, my parents would take myself and my sister to New York City every year, two times a year, and we'd see these incredible Broadway shows. What were some of your favorite shows? My favorite was Thoroughly Modern Millie, and Sutton Foster was the lead, and I knew the whole soundtrack. We actually went to see it twice. Even as she charts her own professional journey, Kelly finds time to give back through her talents. She donated the proceeds of a song she wrote called She's the First to support scholarships for girls around the world who are the first in their families to get an education. The catchy tune is catching on. She is the first to dance, the mark, first to rise, start a spark. And it's been a beautiful thing to see how music, and particularly a song, can be such a personal thing, bring people together. And in this case, for young women around the globe who might need that support, luckily they've been able to get it financially but also mentally, like the song brings something out of them and, and helps them get to school every day or gives them a beat to walk to. So it's, it's been really a beautiful thing. And Kelly says she's been surprised to find out that she's a role model to so many young women and girls. I met a, a girl the other day. I was having brunch with my friend and I was in line for the bathroom and she came up to me and she said, are you Grace Kelly? And I was like, yeah, I didn't have my saxophone or anything. And she's Asian American and she said, I'm your biggest fan, I'm visiting from Seattle. And she's like, I can't, can I take a selfie? And she said, you know, my saxophone teacher told me to look you up and there's not like many other female uh, Asian American women who are playing the saxophone, I really look up to you. Kelly is also innovating to bring jazz to a younger audience. She recently launched a video pop-up series on social media that's already garnered more than a million views. Basically, I take my horn and wherever I'm traveling, I'll find like a really fun, fun thing to do. And it's my way of trying to bring my music and jazz and the horn like to places and audiences where you wouldn't expect it and for it to be this approachable thing. But I think it's important as a young artist to be like merging traditional media with, you know, social media and, and just trying to, to make this music presented to to everybody. I'm Kyung Yoon for Arts in the City.
Just imagine a floating food forest traveling on a barge throughout various piers across New York City. Well, imagine no more, because that's today's Hidden Gem. My name is Mary Mattingly. I am an artist and founder of Swale. Swale is a floating food forest. It's a place where people can come on and pick fresh food for free. It's on the water for a few different reasons. One is so we can actually purify the river water and use it to grow the plants. Another is so we can move around from pier to pier. And I think the most important reason is that the water is really the true commons in New York City. It's a place that's truly public where anyone can come. And the more people we believe we can engage in the watery space, the more we can talk about the commons and the land as a commons too. And we really want to ask, you know, what could happen if we could grow and pick food publicly on public land in New York City. For those of you who are a little, feeling a little brave, but fine. I'll give you a surprise, then you can tell me what it is. People usually just come on and um, someone is here to explain what's going on because I don't think a lot of times people know that they can pick anything. So while we have signs expressing what things are, I think that um, our biggest job is to say, you can pick anything. And um, people are really amazed. I think that, you know, we're in a, such a commodified culture that it's really insane almost to think about something that's just offered to you, that's just a gift, and why can't that be everywhere? But everything you're handing out to us, we can actually eat. Right? Everything <laughs> I'm handing to you, you can actually okay. eat. Yeah. <laughs> when we're on the water, which is kind of such a fantastical space as we're moving around, um, and we get to feel the wake of every boat going by, so it's kind of, it's a great metaphor for community. You're really you really feel the impact of everyone else. When I think about Swale, I think about the potential for social love as a commons as well. So I think it's really about connecting with people in a space that um, comes alive when different people enter it. So it's really determined by who's on it and by how they're interacting with the plants and each other. metaphorical and it's you know the the product of like many people's emotions if you want to visit swale they're currently docked at concrete plant park in the bronx that's our show for today thanks for watching for more information on any of our stories you can go to cuny.tv I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we'll see you next time on Arts in the City.